so did they use a different login here at this in this room than they do like in the 600 building or is it all the same? No, it's all the same. Okay. I thought they had dual uh, systems here. So they can do, is it Windows? Is the You can do Windows or Mac, either one? Got it. So does that before or after you log in? Before. Before, got it. I don't think it, they have that at the digital lab. Uh, okay, so if you jump into our website, I just want to talk about a couple things. Um, the first thing up here is um, uh, the way I want you to name your assignments when you actually turn them in. The majority of the assignments for this class are actually going to be turned in online, so it's a little bit less important, but I don't want to say it's not important at all. Um, uh, but anyway, it's the whole naming convention to use uh, for your name when you turn an assignment. But again, for the most part in this class anyway, this is really more for shooting assignments, but I wanted to mention it. Um, uh, for the most part, like I say in this class, everything that you do will be submitted via Moodle. Uh, we'll go through that in just a second. I'll, t I'll talk about one of those. Um, the next thing down is the class announcements. That's just how I get in touch with you guys if I want to talk to you about something. Um, I will do emails occasionally. I'll do a blanket email as well, or I'll do specific emails. But uh, class announcements is one way. Um, I'm the only one who can actually post in it. The excuse me, do you know how to form is a place where we can all post questions. So if you uh, don't understand something, you got a question about something, do not send me an email. Put it here in the form because if you've got a question about it, there's a good chance other people are ha having the same exact questions about it. But also, equally important, if anybody in this room knows the answer to a question that gets posted there, please answer it. Don't wait for me, okay? If somebody answers a question and somebody else says, well, that's bullshit, put it in there. If you want to sell your dog, put it in there. If you want to, I don't know, have hot sex, put it in there. <laughs> I, I can't promise anything, resolution to any of those issues, but I'm just saying that's where uh, the place to, if you've got anything to say to the class or question or anything else, um, that's where it goes. Okay. So uh, attendance is pretty evident in this class. It's uh, extremely important um, because there is only five weeks of this class. Um, so uh, don't be deluded into thinking that you can just watch the videos. The videos actually do help a lot, um, but they don't replace the experience of being in a room with me. No. <laughs> anyway, just don't think of it in those terms. Um, okay. So. Pretty much all the weeks are laid out in the exact same way. Um, it'll give you some idea of what we're going to actually talk about and do in this class. Um, there's a whole thing here of course materials. These course materials are either um, links to websites, PDFs, um, they're uh, it, just a bunch of things um, that you guys might find useful. My suggestion to you is that before you leave Columbia College that you somehow manage to copy all this list of links and that you also download all the PDFs. Um, you may not be able to, there's a, a, I'm gonna tell you right now, there is an enormous amount of reading in this class. If you take a look at our week number one under the assignments, you will see all of these are reading assignments. It is just the nature of business. I will tell you something else. These lectures can get really long and lecture by and large is really boring. It's so I I do my best to try to engineer things so that we are actually working on something, doing something in class. But if you find yourself getting really tired, stand up, walk around, jump up and down, do jumping jacks, do something. Try to hang in there. I try to make it as uh, uh, um, engaging as I possibly can. But business by its very definition can be a rather dry subject. That being said, um, you've all expressed to me already how important this whole thing is to you. And so um, you just gotta keep that part in mind, okay? Um, there are, uh, this last set of assignments right down here, the last four down here actually are assignments where you will uh, generate things and turn them back in uh, to me that actually do get graded. There is a way I can track to see whether you guys are really reading these assignments or not. Don't make me do that. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, of course. 
Yeah, I would never. I'm actually one of those people who lets you turn in uh, the same assignment for both classes. I think that if you're doing, I th this is my take on that. Is I really believe that if you're going to turn in the same set of pictures for two classes, those pictures should be twice as good as what you would turn in for just one. But the idea that you have to do a completely different set of pictures and in a lot of cases something that would mean nothing to you seems to me absurd. So of course you can turn it in if it's the same stuff, okay? Or if you can, you know, take half of it. I mean, leverage it. I'm a huge believer in that. Uh, okay, so we are going to start out <clears throat> again. Um, note taking is probably strongly encouraged in this, and I don't mean that you have to write down everything I say, but the whole idea that you can actually just jot down a quick uh, line or two uh, of something. You'll see a lot of what we go over today is actually going to be repeated in these readings. Uh, oh, let me, oh, here, totally forgot about this. Um, if you click on the read late assignment policy, it'll pop open. And this is my late assignment policy. I don't accept late assignments. Um, <laughs> that's it. However, there's a big difference in a zero and an F. If you do not turn in, if you turn in something late, uh, you get a zero for it. If you manage to turn it in before the end of this uh, uh, five-week course, um, you'll get an F instead of a zero, but that's a 59 into your grade average as opposed to a zero. Uh, you can't tolerate too many zeros without flunking. You can tolerate a few more uh, 59s. So at any rate, you've got to get it in regardless, so just don't get behind. It's only five weeks. Um, and that's all that is. Uh, and then the next thing, the uh, one other assignment in addition to the four that are at the very end that are not reading assignments is this one about introduce yourself and attach a picture. It's a form where you can actually put a picture of yourself, say a little bit about yourself. It's where other people get to, again, figure out who you are. Uh, we need to sort of jumpstart getting acquainted in this class, so please do that guy um, for me. You also need to respond uh, to a couple of, you need to respond to, you need to post two other responses to somebody or something that goes on in here. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you have any questions, um, put it in the excuse me, do you know how to form? Okay, so we are going to start out <coughs> with uh, really sort of helping you guys establish um, the steps that I think it needs to actually take to, to, to um, figure out the kind of photography you want to do. How many people in here really feel like they know the type of photography that they want to shoot? How many don't? How many people feel like, yeah, yeah I'm kind of into this a little bit and I'm kind of into that a little bit? Okay, no, that's fine too, that's fine too. There's not, there's, there's, you can do both. Um, that's not really, you know, that bad. However, what I will say about this is, is that the beginning part of this is going to be less about the money and more about your identity, more about really, a brand gets thrown around a whole lot, um, I'm, so I'm going to throw it in there as well. I don't tend to look at it quite that way. It's, I think, the same as other people uh, sort of look at it. So I want to talk about that part in the beginning. And then, so there's a series of steps I'm going to ask you to take. You'll actually see it becomes one of the, the it's the, sort of the first, these first four assignments right here, whatever, are actually going to help you um, articulate this. So I want to talk a little bit about that so that you have some better idea about how to do this assignment part. So the very first part I'm going to say that you really need to do for yourself for a successful business is you really need to define yourself. You really need to establish what kind of photographer you really want to be. Um, a lot of people would say you need to find your niche. You need to find what's special and unique about you, the kind of thing that you want to do. So it's not enough for you to say that you want to shoot fashion. That's just too broad a stroke, whatever. You need to be far more specific about that. And I would uh, suggest, strongly suggest that you do it based on the thing that you really love. What is it you really love? I mean, you might as well dream big now. You know what I'm saying? So if all of a sudden you say, yep, I want to shoot editorial fashion for high-end magazines, living in New York, I want to be the next Steven Mizell, well, fine, then that's, you, that's what you write down. That's what you, that's, that's to define yourself. That's what it is that you really want to do. But other people are going to have different um, uh, approaches to uh, all of this kind of stuff. Are you comfortable being a freelancer, or do you really feel like you need to work for a company? There are photographers that I know up and down all over the country that, would, that have to work for a company. They don't want to work. Uh, they don't want to be a freelancer on their own. They don't have the security for that. A freelance career, I, you, I'm a freelancer. I've never uh, uh, actually had a, I've never had a real job other than for my, the company that I own. Um, 
Uh, but um, there's a lot of people who couldn't handle that, who don't. I refer to it as being terminally unemployed because um, you're always looking for your next job, always. You know that feeling, right? Anyway, um, so you've got to make that decision about yourself as well. Are you comfortable shooting on your own or is it something are you really looking to shoot for a company, that kind of stuff? So do you want to do portrait work? Do you want to shoot sports? Do you want to shoot landscape? Do you want to work for National Geographic? All of that kind of stuff that you, you really need to sort of like figure out. However, you that's the dream part of it all. Then you need to take the next step. And the next step in all of this part of it is that you need to really focus on what makes you unique about doing that. Because if you say to me, and people do this all the time, I, I, I this, it cracks me up all the time. People say, you know, I can shoot just like you. And I go, yeah, but all my clients are already hiring me. Why are they going to hire you if all you're going to give them is what I can give them? Right? So again, you need to start thinking about what it is, what your approach is, what is unique, what is it your in, an incredible lighting ability? Is it your connections? Can you, you know, do you, you know, is your, is your dad senator of the state of Illinois, so you have access to places that nobody else in the world has? You know, is that your specialty? Is that the thing that you can offer? What really separates you apart, however abstract that is? Make sense? Um, okay, the next thing you do, and this is actually, people, I, I, I say this all the time, and people, you know, you guys have heard this a thousand times, nobody ever bothers to really, really do what I'm going to ask you to do, um, but you'd be shocked at how important this ultimately ends up being. So, the next thing is you need to set a goal for yourself, a series of goals, not just one. What you really need to think about now is the one-year plan. Where do you want to be in a year? Then I also want you to come up with a five-year plan. Where do you really want to be in five years? And then ultimately, where do you want to be in 10 years? Now, it can be a quick one sentence. You don't need to actually drag this out really long, whatever. But the one-year plan, I'm graduating from Columbia. I want to be in the photo business. I want to be in the photo industry somehow. Five-year plan, uh, I don't want to be shooting pictures at the studio for Sears, baby portraits, whatever. I actually want to be on my own, freelancing, shooting weddings. A uh, ten-year plan. I actually want to have four or five people working for me, also shooting weddings, and I'm taking half their money. Twenty-year <laughs> plan. I want to be on some island, retired. I fucking hate photography. No. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you need to. You, this should be something you actually write down because you'd be really shocked how fast time goes and how. Doing something like that and then every six months revisit that thing that you've written out and say, how well am I doing here? You know? So you do. Your one-year plan is to be doing some kind of photography out in the real world when you leave Columbia. Six months from now is going to be really close to your graduation date. Is that a reality? Is that something that you are six months away from? And if it isn't, then that helps drive a lot of your decision making about what it is you're going to do, who you're going to try to do it with, what you're going to do, where, all the above, right? I can tell you the number of people who have gone through some of my fashion classes here, and they always look at me and they say, well, I'm thinking about, you know, I really want to shoot fashion, so I'm going to stay in Chicago for two or three years, and then I'm going to go to New York. And I'm always like, why on earth would you do that? Why wouldn't you just go to New York right now? You're going to spend three years building your network, building all your connections, getting everything established and rolling, and then you are going to completely abandon all of that and start all over again. So at any rate, if you really do establish this, set up those goals for yourself. Every six months, revisit this. You can actually rewrite it as you're going along. Wow, I really realized that it's not fashion. It's not what I want to do. I really realized that I want to do portrait work. That's all I really care about, blah, 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 blah. These things can evolve, and they should. So, But it's just something I tell this. This is the, this is the one sort of analogy that I can never come up with. I lived uh, in Italy for a very long time. And I spoke absolutely fluent Italian in my mind, not in my mouth. My Italian was atrocious. But in my mind, it was brilliant. It was fluid. It was floral. It was sing-songy. It was, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the reality of it was not. And so this, I think, is what I'm trying to urge you guys to get away from, is that it's not enough for you to say, well, I know in my mind where I want to be in a year. I know in my mind where I want to be in five years. That's a completely different experience than actually writing this thing down, putting it in a place where you know you put it in your diary, put it in your calendar, put it somewhere where you know you're going to actually revisit this and you really can revisit this and look at it and say, 
where am I at on track for this? Make sense? Um, okay, so what kind of clients do you really want to work for? Um, again, if you write this stuff down, can't tell you how important that is. How many people in this room have a print, a print portfolio? I'm going to, I'm going to. Work, people are working on it, right? How many people feel that that's important? You're right, it is. Is it the most important uh, place for your work to be? Where is the most important place for your work to be? Website. It is your website. How many people in this room have a website that absolutely rocks? <laughs> Killer. <laughs> Killer. That you can't believe it when you look at your own website, how amazing <laughs> it is. Uh, at any rate, um, you need that. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say, you know, I will definitely say that it is more important than a print book. However, I feel like a print book also, it's really interesting how things sort of like, um, uh, the pendulum sort of like swings back and forth. Um, and for a very long time, uh, a print book has been somewhat out of favor. Um, it's actually, I think, coming back to that. People, um, especially in photography, um, like um, real, like graphic tactile photography, kind of thing, so it's just something that you should definitely have in your back pocket. Um, for me, the thing that I think is even more important than that is when you're first starting out, when I first started out, I, I my goal in life, my, my mission was to become a photo assistant, that's what I wanted to do. I figured that would be the best way that I could transition from uh, being a student into really learning about photography and uh, hopefully then through that, make some connections and have a career going on, networking, all the above, right? And that's exactly what I did. And that would be, in a more conventional way, what I would suggest everybody in this room to consider doing. That that's actually the easiest way I see to actually making the transition out of school into a photo career. It's extremely uh, difficult and probably unrealistic to assume that you're going to leave Columbia College on you know June 1st and on June 2nd have a full-blown photo career. There's probably going to be something in the middle, and the, end, uh, the middle part should actually be something that contributes to your career. So that would be the assisting part. I would think that part. So one of the values that you have in a print book is that you can call people and say, Hi, Verser. I love your work. I want to do work just like yours. I want to photo assist you. Can I come by and show you my portfolio? Which is a completely different phone call than calling up and saying, Hi, Verser. I really admire your work. I want to do just what you're doing. I'd love to photo assist you. Um, my website is blah, 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 blah. The two different experiences can't even remotely be con compared to one another. In one case, it's I mean, you might as well send it to me an email, and I'm not going to care. In the other, it's actually an opportunity for me to physically meet you and to sit down and talk about something. And so what is it we're going to talk about? Wow, can't believe how well the Cubs are doing. Or, fuck, I can't believe Scandal's not on this week. <laughs> or, we're not going to talk about that, but we can talk about your work. And so the advantage of having a print book is that you can go and meet somebody and at least sustain 10 minutes of conversation focused on just looking at your pictures. In that period of time, you give somebody a chance to actually see who you are, what you're interested in, how you communicate, some sense of who. We went around the room tonight. You told me your name, your favorite movie, and, and I had a whole sense of, uh, I, I don't know exactly who you are. I'm not going to go out that far, but I do have some sense of who you are, right? And so for me, that's one of the single most important things about a print portfolio is that it gives you something to actually talk about. Uh, can you do it with an iPad? Of course you can do it with an iPad. It can be electronic. Um, again, I like, um, I like tactile. That's me. Um, I think you'll find a lot of people uh, respond the very same way. In most cases now, at the level that I'm shooting at, or the work that I'm doing right now, what most people will do is they will look at my website initially, and they'll ask to see, what they'll do is they'll look at a whole uh, bunch of websites. And then they'll call in a set of print portfolios, because they really want to be able to compare a group of photographers sitting around one big table. So there'll be a huge table like this, There'll be 10 people, uh, creative directors, art buyers, whatever, all sitting around, 15 portfolios laying on that table, and people are just randomly going around and looking at stuff and comparing it, and that ultimately is what you get the job out of. So um, it's an important thing to have. It's something you guys need to focus on and think about. Um, 
So some of you guys had said that you're really not sure what it is that you're trying to do right now, what style of photography, or not style, but the type of photography. Some people want to be wedding photographers, some people want to be portrait people, some people want to shoot fashion and weddings, some people want to shoot anything as long as it pays. This is the one piece of advice that I can give you is this about all of that. If you are going to do that, those multiple disciplines, it's not the fucking thing I hate about this room. I can't see you guys in the back. I mean, it's like, anyway, sorry. <laughs> language. Uh, anyway, um, if you are going to do multiple disciplines as far as it goes for photography, you have to have multiple identities. There's simply no question about that. If you're going to be a wedding shooter and a fashion shooter, you need two completely separate websites. You need two completely separate portfolios. You really need two completely separate identities. So does that mean you need two completely different names? I, I don't know that I would necessarily go that far, because that can start to get a little creepy, you know? Wow. Anyway, um, but you really need to keep those things separate. And the reason you need to keep those things separate is, is that people are always looking for the specialist. They do not want somebody who can do two things. They want somebody who does one thing incredibly well. So then you just lie to them about the other thing. Uh, OK. Going back to what Matthew brought up earlier, um, the next thing you need to consider in this whole thing about starting out your whole career. So you're going to define yourself, you're going to set goals, you're going to build your portfolio and your website, and the last thing on this list, the immediate thing on this list, is you need to network like crazy, because that is what this is really all about. Who do you, if you had a job that came up, or you wanted help doing something, whatever, who would you go to? You go to your friends, right? You call up your friends and say, I'm doing this, can you help me out? I'm doing that, Could you, would you help me out, whatever. That's what everybody does. It doesn't matter how big the business gets. Everybody hires their friends. So your job, if you're looking to be <laughs> successful, and no matter what it is, is to be friends with whoever you are hoping to actually get work from. I work with a stylist. Um, I shoot a whole lot of Nike, or I'm shooting a whole lot of it right now. Um, and I work with a stylist who has got to be the single most brilliant networker I've ever seen in my life. We work in this huge studio. She knows everybody's name, everybody's, I mean everybody. The guy who fucking cleans up the bathroom comes by, gives her a big hug, they chat. I mean, she has got this down to an art. Uh, and so it's just something that you've got to, like it or not, you've actually got to do it. So how do you do that? How do you network? Well, there's a couple of things I would suggest to you. Um, fellow photographers, I mean, you guys have just met me. You have just met each other. So that's the first place you can actually start in this. Um, pretty much all the people I know who have gotten really good jobs assisting have ultimately done it um, because they had a friend who, or they had worked on a job with somebody, they knew about somebody, uh, the third assistant or the second assistant gets sick, it's a last minute deal, oh, I'm going to bring Katie in or I'm going to bring Chelsea in because yeah, I've talked to them, I've worked with them before, and then all of a sudden you guys are in another situation where you actually get to meet a photographer, work with them. So. There are photographers, there's students who have left here in the last year who are actually working here in Chicago uh, for really pretty much all the talent that's here in Chicago. Um, and if you guys know those guys, then again, that's a tap that you've got right there in terms of being able, a connection that you can get to them. Hey, you know, do you think you could, uh, you know, see if I could come in and show this guy my book and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Again, first place you can go to. Second place you can go to is there are, um, uh, professional organizations uh, that deal just with photography. The APA is probably the most famous. Um, so it would be the first place that I would go to. There is a Chicago chapter of the APA, and they have bar night. Uh, they do it like two or three times every single month. And the only sole purpose of this is networking. It's the meet and greet place. They also put on events, pretty much like Apple puts on events that'll be lectures, that kind of stuff. Those again, are the, it's, it's places where you can put yourself where you are with people who are like in kind, like-minded, right? So again, it's all of a sudden, you know, you, I, whatever. It's a, just a way, it's a place to put yourself in to connect as far as that goes. There are still all the uh, photo lectures that happen here at Columbia College. You should be at all of those. Again, a ton of people who shoot in this business go to those lectures. And if you put yourself, there's an opportunity that you can meet those people there. Now, I'm not saying you will, or it'll happen every day that'll be really fruitful, but I'm just trying to say, you're trying to put yourself in a position, in a place, where you, where there are people who you could work for. 
Um, the Apple Store, the Apple Store events. There's a series that they do photographers probably six times a year. Um, those would be other things to uh, uh, sort of uh, work on. Finally, there is the broader um, social media context of it all. So again, you can follow people, you can Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, all of those things are all avenues um, for you guys. If you've got a photographer that you really want to work for, start to follow them, blah, 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 blah. Again, it's just the beginning, right? Are there questions about this? I told you this is kind of the boring part. Don't worry, we're going to get to the really headachey math part in a minute. Um, so, in order to help you define yourself, we're going to break this whole part down right now. And this will be this first assignment, who is your audience? So, in talking about who is your audience, the reason that you want to try to figure this out, and this, is a, uh, this took me forever to do this, I initially started my career out, um, I, was, I assisted at Playboy for three years, I went out on my own, and they became my first account. They were my first big client. I hated shooting nudes. I did it for eight years. Hated it. I wanted to shoot fashion. That's all I. So, but I continued to build a portfolio that had to do much more with Playboy advertising, for lack of a better way of putting it. And finally, I realized that the most important thing is I really needed to figure out who it was that I wanted to work for, and I needed to make imagery that actually would speak to them. So instead of showing Marshall Fields a bunch of, you know, cliche party girly pictures, um, I actually did serious fashion work and took it in and started to work for Marshall Fields. Uh, and that was my ticket out. So the question you have to ask yourself to begin with is who is it that you really do want to work for? Because that helps inform you about the kind of pictures that you're going to make. So I think one of the myths that gets perpetuated here at Columbia that's unfortunate, it works for fine art photographers, but it does not work for commercial people. And I'm assuming that you're in this room. Well, let me ask you this. How many people in this room are really hoping for a career as a fine art photographer? Well, that's a good thing because your chances of succeeding as a fine art photographer is 3%. Three out of 100 people who have the ambition of being a fine art photographer will actually succeed at that. And the truth is, they won't succeed as being a fine art photographer. They'll end up being a teacher who does fine art and is represented by a gallery and will sell $10,000 worth of work a year um, but make a living as a teacher. That's not what I'm dreaming for you guys. I'm dreaming for the big money for you guys. Um, so, you got to ask yourself, who is your audience? Yes, Matthew. So what is the percentage then for other areas of photography? You know? uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Hard to be worse. Hard to be worse. But when you really think about it, you know, fine art is, uh, photography is such a rare, fine art in itself is just such a rarefied feel. Whereas photography itself, it's just, it's, I mean, it's immense what you can actually, you know, when you really begin to think about it. You know, it's not just, and it's actually something we, I was going to touch on, and then I decided I wouldn't, but I'll touch on it again right now. There's so many avenues of photography that you could take. You can do the wedding, party, portraiture route. You can do, um, uh, you can shoot. A really good friend of mine is, uh, there, and there's a whole team of them. There's actually one of, a student of mine from here who's on this team who shoots all the work for the Art Institute. There's an entire department that just photographs that collection. It's insane. Um, you know, it just goes on and on and on. There's, you know, there's people who shoot, you know, architecture. There's people who shoot interiors. There's people who do it for realtors. There's people who do it, you know. I mean, it just, it's significantly larger possibility of getting work in that than there is in fine art only. So at any rate, um, but at any rate, if you ask yourself, who do you really want to work for? That helps define everything for you. It tells you the kind of pictures that you need to make. So if all of a sudden you're in a situation and you're trying to think, you've got an assignment that's coming up for another class, for the next class, and you're saying to yourself, well, I really don't know what I want to shoot. I don't know the kind of pictures that I want to make. Project this out. Say to yourself, well, okay, what do I really want in my portfolio when I'm graduating here? Because I want to shoot for, I want to do party pictures for, for CS Magazine. That's what I, my, really my goal is. I want to be a party photographer. Um, I, that's when I first started out. I shot a whole lot of parties as well. Um, I got really good. As a matter of fact, it's really funny. I, uh, I used to shoot all the parties at the Playboy Mansion again because I was working for them. And 
there were a lot of really, not a lot, but there were some really shitty people there. And I learned how to capture people putting food in their mouths with <laughs> such finesse. I could make those people who piss me off look so fucking ugly and do it over and over and over again. I would spend the night dogging them just to make sure that I had 30 pictures of them going. <laughs> it's a whole sense of entitlement and power. Anyway, um, but back to this. If you do really establish in your mind who it is you want to work for, it tells you the pictures that you want to make. It's really ultimately what helps define your brand. Now, when we talk about brand, is there anybody in this room that, I mean, I, this word's been bandied about a bunch, but any, everybody in this room feel good about what branding really means, what we're really talking about here? Because that's another thing, uh, just to, to just sort of, this is going to be a little tangent aside right now, but your brand as such takes its cue from all of these same things as well. So who you want to work for determines the imagery that you make. It determines the imagery that you assign for yourself, the kind of work that you want to do, generate. But it also is everything about your website. If you want to do, if you're the, I'm, I want to shoot rock and roll. I know Katie wants to shoot, she likes sh shooting music, right? Well, so her website is not going to be some button-down, pinstripe, IBM-looking website. It better have some rock and roll and funk to it, would be my guess. Because I would think that that would be the thing that she wants to project about herself. I'm clearly in touch with the music scene. I'm clearly in touch with this part of it. This is blah, 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 you know, and everything that I do about it. So when it comes time for Katie to have another shooting assignment, is she going to say to herself, well, I'm going to go shoot graffiti or I don't know, whatever I was listening to about earlier, right? Or am I going to go shoot another band, right? Well, again, the dream part ultimately for you is to, is to shoot bands. So you're, not that you don't have to shoot other stuff, I get that, for assignments. But if it's left up to you, then clearly you would be trying to do that work that would focus and center around that kind of um, experience, right? And the same goes for you guys as well. So, um, and it's amazing because I see this happen all the time. I used to have an agent who, he would chase uh, jobs. He would hear about, uh, oh, there's a huge kid shooting that's going to happen. So all of a sudden we'd be scrambling to put together a kid's portfolio for me to get out to this. And I would always say to them, you know, this is ridiculous. There's people who do nothing but kids. They shoot kids. That's all they ever shoot. There is no way I'm going to put together a portfolio that it begins to compete with that. This is just a waste of time. And he, he never, he ever, ever got the message. Uh, we would fight about this. We would bang heads about this kind of stuff. And yet I had the kind of fashion work that I did tended to be um, um, higher end retail. That's what I basically did. Um, and he just lost sight of, 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 of looking for that type of client to send my work to. Does that sort of make sense, what we're going here? He was like doing it completely opposite of the way it actually should have been done. He was chasing anything that he could hear about as opposed to looking for people to really um, um, show what was clearly the strongest stuff that I was doing too. So again, all of this, if you get who you're trying to do this for in your mind, um, that helps uh, determine all of that. It also gives your marketing focus, so you know how to market it. If you're doing hardcore rock and roll, maybe you send out, you know, a, 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 a DVD with really good music on it and pictures. I don't know what it is, but it just helps determine and define that for you, right? If you're a landscape photographer and that's what you're interested in doing, then maybe you do some clever sort of marketing landscaping piece. If you're a fashion person, obviously the same deal. So all of these questions start to get answered for you, and I, I would think or argue that what maybe seems overwhelming for a lot of you guys right now is making all those decisions. What kind of marketing do I do? What should my website look like? What kind of pictures do I really want to be making? What should my portfolio case be like? All of those are all answered if you can define who it is you are trying to do your work for because it defines who you are. Um, we've already talked about this. so. With that being said, if you click open, if you should still have this open. If you can click open the who is your audience, there's a series of questions that I'm actually asking you to write about. And it's these guys right here. So in thinking about your target audience, I want you to figure out what do they like and not like? What are their buying habits? 
What kind of photographer do they consume and why? How old are they? All these things you need to take into consideration because those answers to that really will help you establish who it is you're trying to do this for, who your target audience is. So first step on the road to helping develop you. The next thing we need to do is once you can figure out who it is you want to do it for is what is your advantage? And this is the hardest one for people to come up with. So what, are you, what can you uniquely offer in this whole experience? What separates you from your competition? So when you go to, yes? What, what uniquely separates you from your competition? From my competition, I have uh, extraordinarily, extraordinarily, extraordinary lighting skills. I can light the shit out of anything. Um, it really does set me apart. I'm a brilliant manager of talent. Um, I keep budgets on time. I, when I first started doing this, all the studios, mine included, we had to do all the production. So if we were off, if we blew a bid, or if we were off on time, or if we were late, or we didn't get the shot count done, or any, or went over, if there was overtime, all that, we would eat all of that. That doesn't happen now. Nowadays, all the production has been pulled into in-house for most clients. Most people will hire separate producers to actually take care of all that. So in that case, I don't. It's not the same responsibility. But I was brilliant at that. Um, I'm funny. <laughs> I'm not as funny as a lot of other people, though. Um, funny goes a really long way. Again, after everything is said and done, um, I would argue this to you as well. Um, People do make decisions based on your, uh, your your talent as a photographer, which you can really produce as a photographer. But a large part of what will keep them coming back to you over and over and over again is if you're pleasant to work with. Again, funny goes a long way. So uh, yeah, and I've been really lucky. I've had accounts that I've had for 15, 20 years, which is people hear this and then just blown away. Um, I'm still shooting for Carson Perry Scott. I started shooting for them in the 90s. It's, which is nuts. I shot for Sears. Sears actually bought my first house. I shot for them for 15, 20 years. Yeah. I used to do lingerie for Sears, which was, there was no connection with the Playboy stuff because I was never showing anybody any of that stuff. Although, another one of my idiot agents, oh, we'll just show a bunch of your nudes to, to you know, to like Jockey and Victoria's Secrets and all that. And I was just like, that's just really not a good idea. <laughs> you know, not at all. Anyway, oh yeah, that'll be great. You know, no, blew up in my face. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, so anyway, I did Sears Lingerie, and they did, um, it was usually 10 days out of the month, and I did every single month for almost a decade. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so, your advantage, what is it that you can really offer? What separates you from your competition? Well, part of that would uh, force you to actually figure out what your competition is doing. So that becomes another issue that you've actually got to mark down and consider in all of this, is that who is your competition, what's the kind of work they're doing, what then can you do that they can't or they're not doing? And rate cannot be the only thing that you consider in this, meaning they're doing it at $1,000 a day, and your advantage is that you'll do it for five. Not a good strategy to put you out of business. But all sorts of specialty things. You know, are you the underwater fashion photographer? Yep, I do all of my work in a swimming pool. That's all I do. Now, that sounds ludicrous to me, right? However, who's the doctor guy who only does all those underwater pictures of fashion? You guys know who I'm talking about? No, email only underwater. No, this guy, he was a doctor, literally, he was a doctor, and he, oh, I'm going to try that. Somebody shoot me an email really quickly and tell me that i got to come up with the name of this guy, and I'll, I'll send it to you. But anyway, that's what he ended up doing, and he became really famous. So he doesn't do, now he, he, he primarily does coffee table books. I mean, that's what he does, but it's all fashion imagery underwater. So at any rate, uh, as odd as that might seem. Uh, so, um, and you need to be able to articulate this. So. And the second part of this, if you go back uh, in this page, the second part of this, and what is your advantage here, is you actually need to come up with that whole part of it. But you see this sentence right here? This is the thing. Again, somebody mentioned this earlier, your elevator pitch. This, although this is a very, I've actually done this for myself. This is a very sort of like clunky sentence. But it actually does sort of get to uh, the nitty gritty of it. Um, I would say, take this sentence, uh, fill in the blanks, 
uh, and then you might re-look at the sentence and try to rephrase it so it was a little less um, uh, um, deliberate. So for me, so basically what this sentence is actually saying is it's helping you come up with your elevator pitch. What an elevator pitch basically means is that you've got 15 seconds to articulate to somebody what it is you do. You don't have 10 minutes with a portfolio, here it is, blah, blah, blah. You've got 15 seconds. You've got the space between the first and third floor of an elevator. Oh, hi. What do you do? What do you say? We will actually develop this more as this class goes on. For me, uh, I did this last year. I haven't read this since last year, so I may regret this right now, but I will <laughs> read mine to you right now. Um, for retail fashion clients who want smart, refined, original photography, I'm a fashion and beauty photographer who can produce any style of imagery imaginable. Unlike other photographers in this space, my key differentiator is my knowledge, experience, and ability to generate and control light to achieve the particular branding a client needs. Oh, really? <laughs> what does that mean? Anyway. Okay, make sense? Okay, next thing down on the way here is going to be your marketing plan. And this part becomes, again, this is things that I think people have in their mind as a very strong sort of generalization. Oh, sure, I'm going to do e-blast. Oh, sure, I'm going to do have a portfolio and a killer website. And yes, I'm going to network and all that kind of stuff. But it goes beyond that. And in, in the sense, and it's one of the things that you'll hopefully take away from this class is that you've got to do you, this thing. It cannot be this abstract in your mind. It's got to be shit that you actually are writing down, that it becomes real, that it's actually got something. You need a marketing plan, and you need a budget for that marketing plan. So what are we really talking about? So you need a way, ultimately, for clients to find you. If you are constantly chasing a client, if that's all, that's the only avenue that you're giving yourself, you're denying yourself a whole huge opportunity to actually get work. You need to have a marketing plan that essentially puts you out there, gives, you know, Present you to the world in such a way that people can find you. Instead of you having to find every one of them, you actually want to turn those tables. You have a much better shot if 100 people come looking for you than you to go look for those 100 people. Does that make sense? So that's going to be one of the issues that we uh, actually are going to talk about here. Um, and marketing, when you think about it, marketing like anything, like your portfolio, it cannot be a one-shot deal. It's got to be something that you're going to do for the rest of your life. So. You need to consider the activities that you're going to do for all of this uh, and how much money you're going to actually spend doing it. So for instance, let's say that you have got um, five clients that you've worked for for a long time. They're good, solid clients, repeat business, the whole nine yards. And you've got 15 clients that are prospective. They're people you'd love to work for, but you haven't been able to work for them yet. So part of your marketing plan could be, all right, I'm going to send a postcard or a nice little, you know, maybe something a, a little bit, maybe a flip card, something a little bit better to the 15 that I want to work for, but I'm actually going to put together a small micro portfolio for the people who are my clients. I'm going to spend 20 bucks each on the five that I work for all the time, and I'm going to spend a dollar on the ones that I want to work for. You need to work that out in your mind, how you're going to do it. And it's got to be sustainable. It cannot be a one-shot deal. You can't say to yourself, okay, I'm going to do this one big push. I'm going to spend a whole bunch of money and kick it out there once. Uh, half the time, it'll go in the garbage unopened. Um, and then you've lost your, you've shot it. You've lost your chance at all of that. So this has got to be something that you are consistently doing, and that's got to be in your plan. So it's the big money. It's the little money. It's how often you're going to do it, how often a year you're going to do it, the whole nine yards. Um, and in that regard, the things that you need to consider as far as your marketing plan, social media would be the top of the list in terms of how much, uh, how active you are on social media. Do you have a blog that you are writing? If you are, and a lot of people would suggest this, if you are, uh, how often do you update your blog? It should be at least once a week. There's a girl who was in my fashion retouching class five or six years ago. She, she was actually very talented. She wanted to become a, a fashion shooter. That's what she wanted to do. She went to, she, her family was from Boston. So she, when she graduated from here, she went back to Boston and she hit up every fashion photographer on the East Coast that she could find. She hit up every, I mean, she, everybody that she could find. She could not get the first nibble, not the first bite. I want to assist you. No, uh -uh, didn't work, didn't work. Her other real passion in life was travel. She started a travel blog 
and her first six months, she ended up with 300,000 followers, 300,000 followers. Every single travel magazine in the world hires her now, pays her, flies her all over the world to do anything basically that she wants to do because she, those magazines get her 300,000 followers every time they hire her. She's written her ticket. She only travels first class, and she writes it. She goes, you know, she'll travel and leisure. Well, I want to go to Bali for a while and shoot food. Okay. Well, I'm tired of Bali now. I want to go to Vietnam. Okay. I want, you know, it's summertime in, in Russia. I want to go and, you know, shoot architecture. Okay. I mean, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. It's all because of her blog. It has nothing to do with her photography at all. Do you do any social No, media? I don't at all. No. All right. But <laughs> <laughs> he also started before social media, too. Long before social media. <laughs> so at any rate. Okay, so anyway, that's one thing and should be the top of your list. Uh, direct mail is another. Direct mail is actually uh, becoming direct mail suffered seriously in the age of electronic uh, uh, um, uh, because again it was so easy to do e blasting and that kind of stuff. Uh, but direct mail has actually uh, had a resurgence now and it's something that you should seriously consider. Why? Not everybody's doing it. Nobody is doing it. And that really separates you apart. That sets you out. All of a sudden, you get a, you know, a handwritten, you know, uh, uh, letter that's got some amazing little promo piece in it, whatever. And people love to put that shit on their walls. The more interesting your pictures are, the uh, uh, more likely they are to uh, um, do that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know what's going on in your um, um, portfolio classes, but that hopefully will be a whole part of it all. There's uh, other things, events. So there's a whole series of trade shows and professional portfolio reviews. Has anybody in here ever done one of those? Well, there, but there are other ones. Like for right now, for instance, right now this month, Photo Expo is going on in New York, and there's a whole series of uh, professional portfolio reviews, and they will post. So you have to pay to go to them, um, but everybody I know who has actually done it says it's amazingly worth it. And so what they end up doing is they'll end up getting a whole series of art directors, art buyers, all that kind of stuff, and they get huge numbers. They'll get like 300 art directors or art buyers, um, and then you get a list that you get to pick from. And so it'll be the photo editor from the New York Times Magazine, it'll be the photo editor from uh, National Geographic, it'll be the photo editor from DVD Needham, it'll be all that kind of stuff, whatever. And you can go through and cherry pick. So, you know, they'll say, okay, for 100 bucks, you get um, uh, uh, 20 minutes with three people, and you get to pick the people. It can be an amazing thing. Number one, you should be getting good feedback, but number two, again, you're getting your work in front of somebody, hopefully, somebody that you hopefully want to work for, right? So um, those things can be, uh, I actually don't put those things down. I actually think that there's value in those guys. Uh, email marketing obviously is something. Um, there's all sorts of uh, companies out there uh, to do, does everybody know what I mean by, does anybody not know what I mean by eblast? So when you take an image and you uh, actually repeatedly take images and you essentially generate spam, you kick it out to a thousand people. Um, there are better ways of doing that than not. Um, doing that on your own for most people becomes extremely difficult to do um, because usually your internet service provider will keep you from being able to do that. They won't let you send out to more than 15, 20, sometimes 50 addresses. They won't, for instance, if you put together an e-blast, it's got a thousand addresses on it. Most uh, service providers will reject it because they'll know it's spam. Uh, and then they'll blacklist your name and then you lose your ability to work with that ICE, uh, 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 service provider. So at any rate, but there's companies designed to do this. Constant Contact is probably the most famous. Uh, Monkey Survey is another one that will actually do it for you as well. The advantage to doing it through companies like that is that they manage your mail list for you. They do the e-blasting for you and then they also do analytics on it. So they'll track who actually responded to your, who opened your email, uh, did they click on it, did they go to your website, did they do all of that. So now all of you guys who do have your websites, anybody in here running analytics on your website? We'll talk about that tonight as well. Because again, it's important for you. Um, it'll give you not only an idea of what's working, but who it's working with. Um, so the assignment ultimately in this is that you are going to build a spreadsheet that talks about the time a week you're going to spend on your marketing, the budget that you're going to do for that, um, and you're going to lay out your timeline about how you're actually going to spend your money 
over the course of a year, um, doing all of these uh, options in here. Oh, the last one, local advertising, which actually could apply to the people here talking about doing weddings, that kind of stuff. Um, again, there's the Chicago Bride is a, a magazine that's dedicated strictly to uh, the wedding industry here in Chicago. If you're shooting weddings and you're not advertising in there, you're an idiot. Uh, okay, so we already talked about this a little bit, <laughs> your website, how great is it? Um, is it really as good as you are? Um, it's everything as far as this whole part goes. It should reflect your style of photography. Again, if you're doing multiple disciplines in photography, you need multiple websites. There is no crossover. Do not be showing your fucking fine art pictures to wedding clients. They don't want to see it. They don't care about it. They think you're a student, and they don't hire you. Yes? What about, like, fashion, fashion products? Would you do two separate? It's completely separate. Completely separate. One, you're a people shooter. One, you're a still life shooter. Uh, and they... Absolutely do not relate. Yeah, I mean, there are people, I, I've, got, I've got to be really honest with you. Like Raymond Meyer is a guy who's really more known for his still life stuff, but he shoots people. People hire him to do that. But he's been doing this for a really long time. He's really famous. And, and so it's not that, you know, in his case, he could probably mix that up. But I would argue that in your case, you don't want to do that because somebody who's looking at your uh, site who wants to hire you to shoot people. I, they don't want to think they're being distracted. Somehow they want, oh, I just want the best piece of people shooter of all time. I don't want somebody who does other things. You know, jack of all trades, king of none. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Actually, they are close enough. I mix mine together, but in my uh, website, if you actually look at my website, um, you'll see that the beauty, there's a, it's done in sections. That whole part is actually pulled out. Um, but yeah, I actually do do that. Um, and I would keep it that way. Although there's a lot of people that argue you should keep those separate as well. There's a lot of the guys who are shooting beauty in New York, and that's all you see. Um, so for me, I really use the beauty part to boost the fashion. Um, there's not that much beauty work here. Um, it helps. But um, again, in New York, there are just too many guys that are girl people who only shoot beauty, and that's who you're going to be up against. And so I would argue that just a really, really strong uh, a beauty website um, would probably serve you better. Um, okie dokie. So, but back to this. Does your website really reflect the style of photography that you do? How many people in here are working with a canned website? How many people in here do live books? Anything like that? How do you guys, where did your website come from? Squarespace. Squarespace, that's another option. But Squarespace is a canned uh, website, basically. Or Lightroom generates websites, you know, all that stuff. I mean, you can do it. At all sorts of levels, you can spend all sorts of different amounts of money doing this. But at the end of the day, your website really has to reflect the kind of work that you're actually doing. It should be a direct influence. It should be directly influenced by the kind of work that you're actually doing. So um, it doesn't make, in my opinion, any sense if you are doing uh, um, um, uh, low down urban grungy kind of work that you actually put it in a website that's really slick and tricked out and. You know, I ju it just they don't it doesn't make sense to me. Again, this gets back to a branding issue. Make sense? Um, okay. There's a number of things that you need to think about your website. This goes to there's a whole series of practical issues here. How often do you guys update your website? That's a it's a problem. One of the big issues with it is that Google and 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 the search engines that the algorithm that they use for their search engine. Um, what causes you to have a higher ranking uh, in the whole game has to do, there's a whole cornucopia of things um, that are involved in optimizing your search results. We will talk about that three weeks from now. Um, but one of those is how often new content is appearing on your website. They track that. Um, and so at the very least, you should be swapping pictures every couple of weeks, even if it's just a rotation, even if it's not new work. You pull two things out, you put two things up. There's new content on your website every couple of weeks. So um, uh, Google's algorithms are very smart. Uh, I'm not sure they're that smart. So, but at any rate, it should be you should be generating activity on your site to actually get your rankings to go a little bit higher. Um, so a highly functional site should have this on it. You should have clear contact information. 
can't tell you the number of people. It's just, it blows me away who go through all the trouble to get this really cool, amazing thing going and then don't have a way for anybody to get in touch with you. So again, your contact information, uh, an about page, whatever. Um, I, a lot of people would argue that you should be doing the biography section, that you should have a little, you know, picture of yourself and all that kind of stuff, doing your dog and talk about how grand life, I, I don't do that. Um, that's just me. Um, Going back to what you were talking about, Matt, uh, uh, well-organized portfolio sections or galleries, your portfolio section should be strong. Now, how many people here, has anybody here gone actually through an entire um, uh, uh, portfolio development class yet? Okay. In that class, did they stress in, that, in, in terms of actually talking about it, editing your stuff, really having uh, images support other images, really having a sort of cohesive look, all of that, right? Again, your website should actually have the exact same thing. Um, I always talk about it in terms of uh, imagery that supports other imagery. Um, uh, and that uh, this is another thing that has happened with other agents in the past is that I'll have one stunning image that does not fit anything else that I do. And no matter how much you hate to lose that stunning image, if it does not support the rest of your work, it's a distraction. It's a distraction to you and it is to everybody else who sees your site. So as much as you might love that, you have to let that shit go. And it's one of the hardest things that there is to do, but it's something that you have to do. So at any rate, really well organized portfolio sections or galleries. Um, if you are, now this really depends on how you guys are doing it. Uh, for the people who are considering doing weddings, um, I'm not sure. So when you guys shoot weddings, do you just shoot and give the people the files? How does that all work? That's what I'm and what are your packages like? Well, for me, I do hourly, and then um, I'm still figuring that out. Right? Okay. With how many images they get, but I go hourly. Okay, so you charge hourly for the wedding, mm -hmm. for the shooting. Yeah. And do they pay for prints, to, for oh. files, or okay? So then that's when you talk about packages. That's what you're really putting together for them. Yeah. So they never did they ever get the raw files? Did they ever get the files yeah. that you shoot? Yeah. Right, because that's your yeah, that's your ticket, right? I had a bride villa who threatened me and told me that. I owe her all my raw files. So all you clearly files. want to have the contract that avoids that in the beginning. Yeah. We get into this in a really big way in this <laughs> class um, uh, in terms of being able to generate the very explicit language. Because one of the more difficult things that you guys face that, that people who, more like me, who do more commercial stuff is for the most part, now this is not always the case, but for the most part, the majority of the clients that I work with understand how this game is really played. They understand that they're getting to use the imagery. They don't get to own it. Um, working with, uh, you know, the brand new bride every other day, I mean, every other, every client's a new client is a brand new client. You have to educate those people into all of that. Um, and it's something that's much easier, or, or at least, I don't necessarily easier, but much, uh, it's a much better game to play before than after. Um, but in doing all of this, is this all automated on your website? All the all the packages? Yeah. No. Why not? Why? Why wouldn't you have it that way? Why wouldn't well, you have their slip in your credit card, buy this package, and you don't have to fucking deal with it? What? Oh, okay. Well, you met them when you shot the work. Oh well, yeah. What I'm saying is, after the fact, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to deal with any of it? If you had a website that was engineered that they could simply pick all the pictures in the world they wanted, it all starts getting added up, they throw a credit card in at the end, and you don't ever see it or deal with it ever again. You just get the check at the end of the week. Way better, right? In all likelihood, they're probably apt to buy more because they'll go back again. So it's just something to think about in terms of your website. E-commerce is a huge part. Amazon has actually gotten into the business of um, uh, working with smaller people to actually make this all a reality. Um, Square, the credit card people, they're also equally involved in this whole game. But it's just the whole idea that you could actually, you know, um, have a system put into place, even if you had to spend some website designer design this for you, that you could then just, you know, you could do your shooting, it becomes a gallery, you pump it out onto your website, whatever, and then all the money part, all the issues, that, the printing is all automatic. The, I mean, all of that is just taking care of it for you. You don't have to deal with it again. It would be a huge boon, I would thank you, because then you don't have to spend your time doing that. You can spend your time shooting. Anyway, something to consider. 
you know, in your website, e-commerce is a huge issue that you guys uh, should be thinking about. If you, even if you're not doing this kind of work, you should have some sort of file delivery system on your website. For every client that I actually shoot for, for the most part, I'm there and we're shooting and dumping stuff directly into their servers. So it's not something that I really deal with a whole lot, but it certainly could be something that you guys deal with. Um, and it's just a part of your website or the part of what you have bought from whoever your service provider is that gives you space to upload files to. Um, you can sort of do this through Dropbox or through, yes. Um, but again, it just starts to become uh, somewhat onerous. It's better, again, if you have it um, on your website with your name all over the website and your contact information all over it instead of sending somebody a, a link to a complete, to internet. Anyway, you guys get where I'm going with this. Um, again, if you're doing a blog, a lot of people would argue that that's a really positive thing uh, because that too um, generates new content for your space and again, will feed into Google, Google uh, um, Google's um, search engine uh, optimization, yes. Well, what kind of blog? Like, where would you blog? Would you, you can blog about anything. You can blog. No, no, not oh. where, not what, where, like what sites? On. So, like Tumblr, you can only post really couple photos. I, I want to post more. I want to post like one. Most people that I know that are serious about blogging right now are doing it all through WordPress. Okay. Do you think that successful blogs? Um, a lot of writing to them because I hate writing, but I would love to put pictures. Uh, and that's certainly how you could go about doing it. What I would say is that uh, um, uh, probably should be a bit of both. And it doesn't have to be like you know really time-consuming writing kind of stuff. Whatever it can be, more uh, clever caption on an image, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it can you can sort of take it in that direction. I think. Um, but I also know that again, this girl who you know who does the travel work, whatever. A lot of what her blog is about is travel. So she, but she's clearly a writer. Yeah. You know, she clearly has that gift. I'm not a writer, so I don't even, I, I can't yeah. really even go there, right? I'm visual. Um, I, um, I'm dyslexic, so I have, I, I, I love to read. I have a relatively good vocabulary. Um, I spell on the order of a fifth grader. Um, uh, writing is a challenge for me. I, letters that I write to people or stuff that I do, um, I will do endless number of drafts to do it. Um, so at any rate, and I was an English major. <laughs> I was an English major hoping to get into med school. I mean, that was my initial, that's where, yeah. So I went to Tulane, no, this is a true story, I went to Tulane in New Orleans, and I uh, almost flunked out in my first year. I was on Bourbon Street getting drunk and looking at strippers the whole time. <laughs> Which is, doesn't do really good for a really high pressure uh, college atmosphere. Anyway. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> now you're gonna say my your hair is on fire. <laughs> also, your um, yeah, the due dates are. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> so I gotta be honest with you. I did not. I did not put this website up until yesterday because I haven't had any time. So I'll change all the uh, due dates. You know, that's one of the things that you would think that uh, Moodle would actually. <laughs> wow, somebody's not happy about something. Okay. Thanks. Um, we're almost through this part, guys. Um, again, I told you that this wasn't scintillating, but it's really. Um, uh, important. Okay, so um, get through the whole blog part. I've also included for you, again, a lot of the resources that I'm going to ask you to tap are included on this website. So one of the first that you can actually get to is this guy right up here, Google Analytics. And if you click on this, you'll see what it does. It's actually really pretty simple. It's pretty ingenious of them. It's free. So all you basically need to do is sign up for it. And then what they do is they actually give you tracking code that you paste into your pages of your website. Um, and that then gives them information about who's looking at your pages, what they're looking at, how often they spend, how much time they spend on the page. Um, it's a way for you to really begin to understand what part of your imagery is appealing to people and what part isn't. Um, and like I said, it's free. It's really simple to use um, and uh, worth every penny that you're not spending. Um, if you do not know how to do all this stuff, you are um, it's worth every dime uh, to actually hire somebody who can actually help you do this. I don't know if there's still, it seems like the website 
design um, uh, classes, at least in the photo department, have sort of faded away. Uh, um, so I don't know if there is something else here at Columbia. I don't know if there's anything going on in the art department or anywhere else that's actually where you where there are students who are really um, um, uh, perfecting their web design skills. Who's somebody who could actually do the engineering work for your website? Um, that would be, I think, an ideal world. And good, bad, and different. It would. I'm sorry. What? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the thing about Squarespace is that it's actually an option. I, for me, I, um, uh, I, um, I sort of chafe at the idea that I, the whole subscription model of business really bothers me. Um, it's not just them. It's Adobe and what they're doing. It's everything else. I just I struggle with that part of it. Um, so at any rate, regardless, um, there are. Uh, tons of uh, ad agencies here in town that you can, if you if you decide you want to go down that road, I can certainly point you in the direction of some people who do this for a living. Um, and I would strongly suggest that you can take advantage of that. Again, it costs money, but money well spent. You know, you get the first $2,000 job, that 2000 you spend on your website is meaningless. It was worth every penny. Okay. So, at the end of all of this, what we've sort of gone through to charge you with, just a really quick recap, is you need to determine who the hell your audience is. You need to articulate your unique selling point. You need to flesh out a marketing plan. You need to optimize your website. Um, and in the end, you need to remember it's all about the money. Okay, let me, let's do this because I don't want to break too. I want to be able to break. I'm going to get through one last small part of this. And then when you guys come back, we're going to get into some real nitty gritty. Uh, how many people in this? Um, no, what, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, um, so once you get through all of this part, once you sort of establish who it is you want to shoot for, how you want to work that whole part out, who your marketing, I mean, who who your target is, uh, how you're going to market to them, what your website's going to look like, the kind of work that you want to do, then your and the goals that you have set for yourself are sort of short medium and long-term goals, once you get all of that sort of like fleshed out, and again, it's relatively easy to do. This isn't something that's going to take you six months to do this kind of work. Um, you, it's going to take more than a weekend, but it's something that, again, once you sort of begin to lay that out, two things will happen. Um, the first thing is that you'll actually feel like you're doing something, and there's an enormous amount of security that comes from that, that all of a sudden you can say to yourself, okay, I'm... I am now working, I'm now building my business. I am now actually doing this. Uh, it's the one thing that I can say to you, this is again a bit to an aside, but nonetheless, I, I, it's absolutely true. As a freelancer, you're always freaked out that you're never gonna work again. That just kind of goes with the territory. For the first 20 years of my career, I was like, okay, I'm never gonna work again. I'm never gonna work again. And I've managed to work constantly through the whole thing. but. In those times when you think you're never going to work again, and you start panicking, I mean, and you do, I mean, you lay awake at night, and all that. I mean, I, I'm not trying to make this a bad thing for you guys. I'm just trying to say that that is the reality of it. Um, the one consolation, the one thing that I found that could always get me over that, the one thing that would always assuage that fear and that panic was to work. So whenever I get really flipped out that something wasn't happening, I would immediately put together a test shoot. I would, uh, to, I would put together some, some way to make some pictures that I could use from my portfolio. That was always what I would do. And in the process of doing that, while I was actually generating those pictures, I knew that I was working. I knew that I was building something, but it was actually, it was my job. I had a friend once who was a design student, and, I, I, and he said to me, he had gone through a really rough patch. And, he said, he, one day he just sat down and he said, you know, I need to design myself a job. That's what I need to do. And that's what he did. So I'm just throwing this out to you. You may look at this and say, come on, Richard, this is just busy work. Every fucking cheap ass book you pick up on freelance career is going to tell you the same thing. But the truth of the matter is actually doing, physically doing the exercise and that part of it, whatever, will actually generate this sense that you are actually doing building your business. And so it's just something um, I'm really, really hoping that you guys are going to go through the process of. So once you get through that whole part of it, 
Then we need to get down to a little bit more nitty gritty as far as this part goes. And this is going to be the more practical things about how to actually do the work I've just asked you to do. So the thing that a lot of people will look for in doing all of this, or the things that people will mention or talk about, is a business plan. So anybody in this room have any idea what a business plan is? So a business plan, imagine this. If you, let's say that you uh, were proposing to um, start up a company um, and you needed to get a loan to do it, um, and you would go to the bank, and all the questions that the bank is gonna ask you is essentially what your business plan is. So what they're gonna ask you is, okay, what is it you're planning on doing? Uh, how much money can you expect to generate? What are your expenses gonna be? It's all of that kind of information, right? It's really sort of like laying out on paper what you think is really going to happen, what you anticipate to really happen. And it again is something that you guys need to do for your own stuff. You need to figure this part out. So in writing a, the business plan is, uh, and again, it's something that can continue to evolve, but a lot of people, akin to the, the people that I've been reading a lot of this uh, stuff about, they make this sort of similar to, if you decided you were gonna drive here to a Packers game in Green Bay, what would you do? How would you get directions? Google. Google Maps or GPS or whatever, right? And then you would have some idea of how you were going to go about going to the thing of Green Day, right? Business plan is the same thing. It's a map. It's a model. It's how you are going to get from here where you're at right now without a business to the place where there is, is your business. It's just how am I going to actually go about doing this? How am I going to go through this? How are you going to finance it? How are you going to fund it? Is it going to be mom and dad? Are you going to take out a loan? Are you going to do this on credit cards? Are you going to continue to work at Whole Foods? Are you, I mean, how is this going to happen? All of that has to be a part of your thinking in this. You cannot just wing this. In developing that plan, hopefully you will spot the parts that are going to be successful you and also spot the parts that are not going to be and avoid those guys. Um, so anyway, it's your vision. It's your vision about how you're going to get to where you're trying to get to. So in doing that, there are four key elements to actually doing this part. The first they call is your vision and your mission. So I said this to you before. I'm going to say it to you again right now. This is the best time of your life to dream big. And so the first question you ask yourself is, what is, your, what is the dream here? Is it to be really rich? Is it to be famous? Is it to be rich and famous? Is it to be not famous but really rich? That was mine. <laughs> I really didn't want, I, I don't like attention, I really didn't want any of that, but I really wanted the money. Um, so that, anyway, that was mine. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, ultimately, what do you want to achieve in all of this? Again, for me, it was actually, it really was uh, the money. Um, what do you want to be the best in the world at? I wanted to be the best person in the world who is actually um, uh, the working, steady working photographer who could then do whatever I wanted to with all the money that I actually made. Am I focusing on the money too much? Um, so again, this ultimately then helps you decide what kind of clientele you want to go for. So in my case, I did want to make money doing this. There is no money in editorial photography. So it didn't make any sense for me to go to try to work for Vogue or for Bazaar or for L or anything like that. It just made no sense for me to do that. That wasn't going to be, that wasn't going to give me what I wanted. Now, does that mean I wouldn't love to have, you know, photo spreads in Vogue and L and uh, Bazaar? Of course I would. But that wasn't the ambition, that wasn't the goal, that was certainly, if that had become a byproduct of it all, that would have been fine, but that was not the goal and ambition. For a lot of people, that is. That's all they want to do. All they want to do is shoot, you know, for the, um, do that kind of work. It wasn't that for me. So again, knowing what it is you really want to get out of this really helps you establish who you want to work for, who you want to do this work for. I was much happier working for Lord & Taylor than I ever would have been working for Bazaar. I would have gotten more notoriety at Bazaar, and I probably could have parlayed that into more ad work, which possibly should have done. But at any rate, you guess where this is going, right? Um, so anyway, you need to be as specific as possible about this as much as you possibly can. You need to define, again, this gets back to the whole niche that you want to work in, um, the type of experience not only you want to have, but the experience you want to deliver. 
You know, do you really want to be the high-end person who only flies first class and does everything first class, first class hotels? Is that the kind of environment that you want to work in and the people you want to work with? Those are really shitty people, by the way, just throwing that out there. Um, but anyway, you get where we're going in here. So those two are dovetailed with exactly what we were talking about in the beginning, right? Finding your niche, who it is you want to work for. You need to articulate that. That's the first step of your business plan. The next part of your business plan is your milestones, and this goes right back to your goals. Where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in two years? Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Um, all of that, um, you need to actually define those things. Articulate those things in your mind. Don't just say, yeah, I want it to be really cool. I want to be, yeah, I want to be really successful. And that's, that, that's not articulating this specifically enough. Then the next thing we get down to is the marketing. And you need to, again, you need to decide in your marketing who it is you're trying to reach and how can you reach them. Right, so are you going to, let's say you want to be, um, you know, the landscape guy, are you going to send all your e-blasting to um, uh, L Magazine? Probably not. There would be no reason. That's not the kind of work that you want to do. Are you then going to actually research and find out who really does shoot landscape or architecture, if that's what you want to do here in town? Who does shoot landscape and architecture here in Chicago? Edric Blessing? one of the biggest in the world. At any rate, I, again, what kind of work do they do? You need to show them that kind of stuff. So then all of a sudden establishes to you the kind of marketing that you're actually going to do. Do they only do black and white? Do they only do large format? Do they only do whatever it is they do? Whatever, this helps establish all of that for you, right? Um, and then finally, and this is the part that we're going to get into as we come back from the break, the next part, and this is the part a lot of you have already brought up and that you're, we're going to talk about here, is that um, pricing and cash flow. How do you price yourself? How many people in here have any idea what to charge? What's that mean? And how do you know? Um, it's a mix of not just the shoot itself, but also post-production. Okay, so is it based on hourly? Is it based on what's it based on? Partly hourly, partly how many looks are in, just the final image, just say what. And gut instinct, and anyway, we're gonna get down. <laughs> yes. How do you like? I just want to answer this. How do you like figure out what's a good price point and how to like up that without losing? We're gonna talk That's about. We're going to talk about all of that. Okay. Is a lot of your stuff the repeat clients or is it new clients? Both. Okay. So usually I have the same people and the same people from last year. Right. Or like other people that heard about it. Right. Um, bottom up. So. No, no, but that's actually, that's, that's, no, but that's, that's the way most businesses actually start out and work is, is it's this sort of organic, spread that goes out um, and and the thing that you're facing is that is 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 a huge problem it's a huge issue so what I usually try to suggest and the thing that I'm going to suggest to everybody in this class is that number one we need to find out what you really need to make to live that's going to be where we start that's not my main job right now so I think that's why I have something forward when uh -huh. I it I yeah so we need to, without getting into actual brass tacks, we're actually, when you guys come back after the break, whatever, we're going to start going down that road about really trying to establish what it is you need to live as a photographer or just doing this as a shooting business, not with something else on the side and that kind of stuff. In terms of the whole uh, discussion about uh, raising your prices and all that kind of stuff, um, that's a whole lot more complicated. We actually get into that a little bit later, but I'll give you the short answer right now. Um, the hardest thing there is in the world, and it's the single thing that I, I try to convince everybody at this stage of the game. It's the biggest problem with lowballing to get work, and it's what every student who leaves school actually does: is they go into a situation that should be paying fifteen hundred dollars a day, and they say, "I'll do it for five, um, because they want the work." And five hundred dollars sounds like a lot of money to begin with, but then two years later, you find yourself in a situation where you're really grinding it out, and you're doing. $1,500 a day work for 500 bucks. And it's how do I get my rate up? And it is so much harder to get your rate up once you've established it at that rate than it is to have gone in in the beginning 
and maybe not gotten as much of the work but said this is where my rate's at and just had it happen that way. That doesn't mean it's impossible because now what you're faced with is justifying it. And in justifying it, you've got two options that are going for you. Number one, pretty much everybody in the world, I mean, CPS is a perfect example right now. They are expecting more money than they had last year, and everybody is essentially, not everybody, but a lot of people are actually supporting that choice and saying, well, yes, every year you should be making more money because it costs more to live every year, right? But the other thing is that you've got two more years of experience than you had before. Your imagery is better than it was before. If your imagery is better, then it's worth more. If it's worth more, you're going to charge more. I mean, there's all sorts of things, but the one thing that I would caution you against doing is just arbitrarily just saying, boom, my rate doubled, or boom, my rate's gone up by 25%, without an argument behind why that actually happened. Right. Um, and so your job now is to really come up with the real convincing argument of why you're worth 25% more, 50% more. Uh, and, then, and you simply lay it out that way. And, and I would suggest you also do it up front. And so when the next client, the, the friend of the friend comes along, and let's say you did the initial wedding for 1000 and now you want 2000 for it. And you say to this, new, they call you up and they say, hi, I want you to shoot my wedding. And you say, fine, I just need you to know right here, right off the bat, whatever, my rate has gone up significantly from when I shot Julie's wedding, um, and this is why. And you should also know that there's a number of people who have actually paid me that. And they're very happy with the work, and I think you will be too. Again, it's just that you put it up in front. It's just like uh, all this political shit is going on. When you know the nightmare stuff, the people who like try to hide it or sort of like sneak it in or around or whatever, it always blows up in your face. So if it's where you really want to go, my suggestion is you just you shout it from the rafters. I mean, you're out there as big as life, saying this is it, my new rate, and this is why, and I, you know. And I really love working with you guys, and I really respect your, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you sell it, but that would be my take. But again, it's getting your price up is tough. Right. And I've done it, like, slowly. So it has gone up, but it was, like, I started out, like, slowly. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to move it more. And then this summer I had, like, a rate that was up higher, and people didn't make comments about it. Right. And, like, and then I also put restrictions before I would just, like, shoot and be like, here's all the pictures. Now I get a certain amount of images because that was a very big headache. Right. So, yeah. No, no, and we'll talk all about usage in this class because the real truth of the matter is the shooting part, for the most part, doesn't mean anything anymore. It's all about usage now, which goes back to what we are talking about with a couple of other. Again, if we're talking in foreign terms to you guys right now, don't worry. We'll talk about all of this. I promise. Um, okay. So pricing and cash flow, we're going to actually talk about that um, as soon as we get the last thing that I want to show you really quickly is this. Again, if you go back to our website, there's two things here you're going to care about. It's this, uh, actually the second one right down here, this uh, NPPA cost of doing business calculator. You are actually going to, I think, it may not happen this week. I, I don't think it does. It happens next week. Well, maybe it does happen this week. Nope, it does happen right here this week. The final assignment for this week is to actually calculate your cost of doing business. There's two things that you should look at. This first thing up here, the ASMP cost of doing business. This is strictly helps you sort of get in your head what the terms are that you're going to need to use to figure this out. Um, the second thing is actually the calculator. We may actually do this in class if we have time. Uh, Google Analytics I already explained to you what that is. This is just a link to that site. We're going to talk about the rest of this stuff when we get back. Oh, but the last thing I wanted to show you is when in terms of helping develop out your business uh, plan right here, there's also this guy right here, this photo business plan workbook. This will actually help you, it's, uh, it's actually something that's probably, uh, you can do it on screen. Uh, um, you don't have to print this thing out. but. In terms of the issues that we were just talking about, it really will give you sort of like a page by page place to sort of like fill this out, all this information out for yourself and sort of try to develop that part. Does that make sense? Okay, guys, why don't we do a quick 10 minute break and come back and we will get into much more nitty gritty, much less theoretical.